Why stop at a seven-day forecast? I'm meteorologist Don Paul. Welcome to the Don Paul podcast. And why is it that the National Weather Service, the three local TV stations here in the Buffalo television market, and me stick with seven days? It's because verification scores for forecasting beyond seven days really drop sometimes like a rock, especially if you're talking about precipitation. Now, there are long-range products we can get from the supercomputers from the European Center for Medium-Range Weather Forecasting. They put out the European model and the U.S. Center on the college uh, campus at the University of Maryland has a global model that goes out further in time. But the reliability for precipitation, the development, passage, and timing for specific disturbances and low pressure systems beyond seven days really slips. So we're sticking with seven days with occasional meanderings into going beyond that time frame when there is a really strong signal. Even in the seven day time frame, statistically, the further you go out in the seven day forecast, the greater uncertainty should exist by day seven compared to days two or three. But there are some occasions where we have a really strong signal about days six and seven. A big pattern change is coming. It may be accompanied by a squall line ahead of a strong cold front, where the signals for days two and three are meh, blah, very weak. So there are those occasions where we feel better about day seven than day three. But typically, that's not the case. The big stumbling block isn't a block, it's kind of a mushy area called chaos theory. The atmosphere is not made up of Lego blocks that snap neatly into place. It's fluids and gases, uneven heating, pools of warmer oceanic water, fast moving small disturbances that beyond day seven are almost impossible to time or to also detect their intensity, what they might do to a given forecast area. So seven days right now is the time frame in which there is much greater reliability than there was 20 years ago. In fact, when I was in college, the extended outlook only went out a couple of days beyond tomorrow. And that's because we didn't have, I'm that old, yes, I am. We didn't have the computer models when I was still in college. Uh, And then they began to develop much more so in the 70s and have uh, since then we've gotten into high resolution models that only cover about 60 hours because they have so much uh, data crunching that's necessary they can't be used to go out the full seven days but we have global models the european model the american model the canadian model the japanese model that go out further in time but uh, you won't hear forecasts of next Tuesday, let's say that would be for today, day eight, scattered showers in Orchard Park at 2 p.m. That kind of forecasting we know does not work well. And no one keeps a more rigorous verification score uh, regime than the National Weather Service. They really do check their forecasts, not just in the office, but also at their regional headquarters, constantly scanning for accuracy or pattern with errors developing more frequently than the boss's think uh, should be happening at this time. So in general, we do better with temperatures further out in time, especially in those global models and ensembles of those models, in which in the European model, we actually, they, the European Center, runs 51 versions of the European model, each with slightly different initial conditions, because we can never know the precise initial conditions of the atmosphere due to It's mushy, mixed up nature. And then these ensembles develop a a mean, an average for all 51 members of that ensemble. That can be used especially to predict a major pattern change coming a couple of weeks in advance if it is a major pattern change. So someone like me may venture a good guesstimate that in about 10 to 12 days, it will turn much colder. Uh, By the way, as I record this, that's not the case at this time. And uh, I see still being offered by some private sector forecasting groups, you can reach online or on your smartphone, 30 and 45 day forecasts day by day. In other words, going way beyond trends and actually putting out forecast information. And this is based on model output. The problem is, while those models are designed to put out that stuff, no one in operational meteorology who has a grasp of their science 
will use that model information because the verification scores show no skill in forecasting specifics in that time range. And there's one app that keeps showing up on my smartphone. It's a pretty good radar app, but it also offers, if you pay the money, a 14-day hour-by-hour forecast for your area, for your zip code, I think. 14 days hour by hour. That, ladies and gentlemen, is, in my opinion, junk science. And it's really worthless. And even, in my opinion, the purely computerized forecast you have access to on your phones uh, generally is inferior to a human-machine mix where there are human beings still massaging the computer output. We are not at a point where totally auto automated forecasts do a job that's comparable to a job in which meteorologists are allowed to go over the models and the real-time data and come up with a blend that produces a more reliable forecast. So that's the general idea. And as far as this time of the year, and white Christmas chances. I just wrote a column for the Buffalo News today on white Christmas chances in Western New York slipping but not disappearing because we do have a fairly reliable pattern between now and getting close to Christmas Eve of an absence of true Arctic air dominating with a favorable wind flow, let's say over Lake Erie to produce lake effect snow. But it's not out of the question farther out, further out in time when we get closer to Christmas Eve that a dip in the polar jet stream might deliver some polar air into the Great Lakes. The signs aren't there right now, but there are hints that it's still conceivable. And the disruptions in something you've all heard of, the polar vortex, which is what led to the deadly blizzard last December, uh, those disruptions are predictable really no more than two weeks in advance. No one last October 2022 could have said there was going to be this horrible polar vortex disruption leading to a deadly blizzard late in December in western New York uh, because it's simply not predictable that far out. So I'm going to stick with being scientifically conservative because that's what most of us do. I hope that if you had such a question, answers your question. And if you enjoyed this episode and the blog in general, I hope you will share and I hope you will follow. And I will have another episode coming up very shortly.